My name is Małgorzata bakalacz Diverge. I am a director of academic programs at the Center for Jewish History, together with LBI, Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and Fordham University's Center for Jewish Studies. I am thrilled to welcome you today at this virtual space. Uh, a few weeks ago, I would proudly add that the Center for Jewish History is a home for archival collections of five partner institutions, Yeshiva uh, Institute, for Jewish Research, Leo Beck Institute, uh, American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Federation, and Yeshiva University Museum. And that together, these collections create the second largest archive of the Jewish experience in the world. And while this remains true, today I would also like to add that we aim to be an intellectual home for exchanges of ideas, scholarship, creative practice, and groundbreaking encounters that we are that are inspired and informed by these archival collections. And if there is a spark of hope to stick to in this tough time we live through, uh, maybe it's actually today's attendance, uh, which reaches beyond borders and time zones and is a sign of our unfading curiosity, our thirst for the learning community, and our need to make sense of the world we live in in a thoughtful, academically informed way together. Today we're celebrating the release of Magda Tether's book. I have it here with me, uh, Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth. A book that will stay with us as an important reference point for a while, not only as a monumental work of historical analysis, but also as a complex and relevant commentary on the present. Uh, I'm happy to introduce the author now and her present. Magda Tether is uh, Schwiedler Chair in Judaic Studies and Professor of History at Fordham University. Uh, her, her work focuses on early modern religious and cultural history with emphasis on Jewish-Christian relations, the politics of religion, and transmission of culture among Jews and Christians across Europe in the early modern period. She published numerous articles and books in English, Polish, Italian, and Hebrew. Magda Tether was recently appointed as a National Endowment for the Humanities Senior Fellow at the Center for Jewish History. And uh, over the course of the next academic year, let's hope, uh, she will be working on her current research project called The Dissemination and Uses of the Jewish Past, the Role and of the Present and in the Production and, po of, and Politics of History. I'm sorry. Uh, let me repeat it. Uh, the dissemination and uses of the Jewish past, the role of the present in the production and politics of history. Joining her in the discussion will be Sarah Lipton, uh, who is a professor of history at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Her work focuses on religious identity and experience, uh, Jewish Christian relations, and art and culture in high and later Middle Ages. Uh, her book, Dark Mirror, The Medieval Origins of Anti-Semitic Iconography, examines how changes in Christian devotion and politics affected the visual re representation of the Jew. It explains the emergence of the iconographically identifiable Jew around the end of the 10th century and brings theoretical coherence to the dizzying proliferation of images of Jews in subsequent centuries. Sarah Lipton's current project, The Vulgate of Experience, Art and Preaching in the High Middle Ages, explores why and to what effect Christendom invested so much in worshipping the ineffable word through the material thing. It is always a pleasure and privilege to be grateful, so I would like to once again thank our partners, the Obeck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and Fordham University's Center for Jewish Studies for making this event possible. Before I leave the stage uh, to this fascinating discussion, I would like to remind our audience of a few maintenance items. Uh, so first of all, all your microphones and cameras are turned off and will remain to be turned off. And that is in the order to avoid any feedback and technical issues. Um, fine. Uh, also, you are welcome to send us your questions for the Q&A portion. Uh, and in order for, uh, for you to do that, you need to use the chat function. So please type them in and we will be reading them to the discussants. Um, 
You can use chat also to contact us if there is any technical issue that we can troubleshoot for you. And finally, our program is recorded and will be available via the center's website and YouTube channel. And now, without further ado, Magda Tether and Sarah Lipton. Thank you, Malga. Hi, Magda. Okay. Good. Um, I think. Uh, uh, okay. I think we're okay now. I think uh, there was a, an issue. So um, I want to welcome everybody as well, and I want to also say a few thing, a few words of thanks to the center, to Yeshiva University Museum, to Leo Beck Institute, uh, and and to Sarah Lipton. It is such an honor and pleasure to have this event um, with Sarah. I uh, wish we had it in person. Uh, but uh, such is life, uh, and I think it's a reminder that we live through history and we don't know what happens, and we only study the history from uh, the vantage point of the future. So we, um, I'm really grateful. I'm also uh, moved by the fact that our conversation is during the Easter Passover season, um, because many of, my, of the stories in my book are, in fact, related to this, uh, to this season of celebration, but incredible tension and often uh, also violence. So um, by way of, um, of saying a few words of introduction of, about the project, I, just want, I also wanna say that as the book was um, coming out and in production, I felt like I was living in a twilight zone and that I was, uh, you know, thank you, be careful what you wish for. Because when the project started, I, um, I thought that this was really going to be a historical study. It was, uh, it was pretty circumscribed historically and, and uh, geographically as well. Originally, it was a much narrower project uh, that then the trail of sources took me much further afield. Um, but it, it was not for the uh, trail of sources that I, uh, that uh, that uh, the project changed and made me think that I am living in Twilight Zone, but also because of the resurgence, uh, recent resurgence of anti-Semitism, and in particular when the book was actually in production, I had to change my introduction because in April 2019 the San Diego shooting happened and the uh, shooter referred to one of the characters of my book. Simon of Trent, which the slide should show in, in a moment uh, for you. Um, that's an, an image, a very famous image that was really made famous by the Nazis, uh, uh, which is why these, uh, these groups now are using it and reusing this, uh, this uh, image. So that was a, a painful reminder that, uh, again, be careful what you wish for when your scholarship may become relevant. Um, the, uh, the, when I started the project, I, um, I intended to look at Poland and, uh, and Italy, two Catholic regions with very different outcomes for Jews and the accusations against them, blood libel accusations in which Jews were accused of killing Christian children. And one of the key documents uh, was the um, a report by Cardinal Ganganelli, who you can see on the slide um, coming up, uh, who uh, wrote the report in um, 1759 at the, uh, for the uh, Holy Office of the, of the Inquisition. Um, the report, the original report is in the Holy, in the archives in the Vatican, and a copy of the report is in the um, Center for Jewish History at the Yeshiva University Museum. Uh, we are experiencing technical difficulties with the slide, so bear with us. Um, the report is celebrated now as this, um, a uh, very important statement from the Vatican condemning blood accusations against Jews, uh, but in fact, it was a secret report. And 
um, and uh, and uh, it was only be, it only became known in the 19th century. When I started this project, I also didn't realize how much the uh, story of Simon of Trent was going to matter. I thought it was going to be just briefly mentioned, but yet the, the character and the story became such a central player uh, in the subsequent history of anti-Jewish accusations. And it's partly because uh, this was a liminal and pivotal case. It was not the first one in accusations against Jews. It was not the last one, but it was one that made through the imagery, as you see here, uh, made the stories uh, imaginable uh, through visualization. It also is the first time where mass media was used to disseminate anti-Jewish stories. In the medieval period, these stories were rather local, um, therefore would have to be, if there were shrines, if there was art, they would have to be seen locally. With the invention of the printing press, these images began to be disseminated and they, and they developed a, an, a sort of iconographic vocabulary for the depiction of these accusations and and the the really and making the impression uh, on the readers or viewers that a lasting a, a lasting impression of that so impression uh, important that iconography was that over the centuries it influenced later representations um, of this, these uh, accusations and and in, inspired um, the uh, later on modern anti-Semites and Nazis to use that iconography uh, in their anti-Semitic propaganda. And in a moment you'll see an image from a 19 30 for um, Der Sturmer, which was devoted to these anti-Jewish accusations. Um, this is front page and inside there were 21 pages devoted to these stories. And you can see including the images that we just saw before of Simon, uh, that uh, the one from the Center for Jewish History uh, right here on the uh, left uh, of the of the image and this is the moment where that image becomes icon iconic for the uh, telling of this the, uh, story of anti-jewish accusation of course the nazis didn't think they were anti-jewish accusations they were um they were jewish uh, crimes in their mind and in their propaganda um it, to the uh, right you see other uh, other images and the highlighted version is the uh, the list of uh, 130 something uh, stories that the Nazis claim claimed were examples of Jewish crimes against Christians and they were all to my surprise uh, uh, sourced from the, the sources books that I've read for this book so these uh, the, the paper tree that was cre cre created in the uh, early modern period uh, after the di dissemination and the, the invention of print uh, became a source for modern anti-Semites as well for the Nazis and then uh, subsequently the Nazi material entered the uh, contemporary anti-Semitic language and, uh, and, and media. So uh, the, the uh, accusations emerged in the Middle Ages, but really became rooted in the, uh, after the, the, the invention of the printing press. There were, since the med medieval period, since the first actual accusations, not just stories, but accusations, um, uh, there were the defenses uh, and uh, arguments against them uh, very well known, but they did not, um, uh, they were accepted by some, uh, but were, they were equally rejected by others. And it, the power of the media, the power of the imagery, the power of the books and the dissemination uh, made the stories, these accusations, much more rooted than the defenses, which were much less dis uh, disseminated, much more, uh, much more treated in, in, and remained in the archives. Um, the uh, the books the images had actually an impact on the 
court uh, uh, trials as well. And no, in no place was it more obvious than in Poland uh, when um, these, uh, these accusations took place. And th the examples that you see right now on the slide is the, how the chronicles, so not just anti-Jewish works, but chronicles disseminated these stories. They developed a vocabulary uh, that then became ingrained in European Christian uh, imaginations of how to speak about Jews, how to describe Jews. Not all was um, lost, however, there were regional differences. These stories um, were accepted in some places and less accepted or more nuanced in others. And we see regional uh, uh, sort of uh, groups of e e epistemic communities, uh, as I call them. I call German polyphony because we see both anti-Jewish uh, accusations and yet uh, also through Christian Hebraism appreciation of, uh, of Jewish rituals and of Jewish um, uh, books and sources um, and not an uh, 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 sort of wholesale condemnation of Jews and Judaism. Uh, in, in Italy, it was mostly the interest in theological polemics, so almost no interest in anti-Jewish accusations, except even though the story of Simon of Trent was uh, also an, a part, partially an Italian story. And yet it was not pivotal. It only led to devotion in one town rather than the wholesale accusations that would happen elsewhere in, uh, in Europe. And especially in Poland. The, uh, in the is, uh, late 16th, but really 17th century on, Poland becomes the, the, the center of anti-Jewish accusations. And it's partly because these stories become um, spread by the literature, by the works that don't have any counter uh, literature that appreciates Jews and Judaism as it was in the other regions in Italy or in Germany. And when you look at the maps, uh, I, I prepared two maps for you, which you can see and play with. They are interactive on the book's website. Um, between when the when the accusations emerge, some of them are only in legends and stories. Some uh, did have actual court proceedings. This map shows whether they were court proceedings or not. Uh, they are spread. They, uh, they, they are spread in their, they appear in England. They appear in France. They appear in in German lands in Italy and in Eastern Europe. But when you look at the later period, which the next map shows you, um, is that the majority of the cases after the printing press uh, disseminated these stories appears in, in Eastern Europe. So uh, we can trace that, um, and in and, and one of the chapters I trace it, uh, uh, how the court records and court trials change and the outcomes change uh, thanks to the dissemination of these stories. And just as there were regional differences for Christians, how they were viewing and how they thought about Jews, so were there the regional differences uh, in, uh, among Jews. So Sephardic Jews uh, focused mostly on polemic and apologetic material, and uh, Ashkenazi Jews focused mostly on songs and tales that celebrated the martyrs uh, who, um, who were killed during these anti-Jewish uh, trials. And so uh, just to wrap it, wrap it up, I would just say that um, the books try to show that not just the, um, it's important to understand that certain ideas exist, but also how they uh, disseminate, how they are rooted, how, in what, uh, what modes and in what context these ideas um, uh, spread out. Um, it also shows, and this is what is striking also in our time, um, that what one reads, what sources of information there are matters books, media, art matter. And finally, also relevant to, I think, our times, uh, the leadership matters. 
public pronouncements matter uh, because even if they may not be effective, they can be uh, then uh, used and mastered for those who want to uh, find some sort of back, uh, backing up. So I'll stop here um, uh, and, and we'll turn it now over to our uh, conversation uh, with Sarah Lipton, who, uh, who is the author of this really amazing book, which you all should read, uh, The Dark Mirror, and has, is, is a really wonderful interrupter. So th Sarah, now it's us. <laughs> Well, thank you, um, Magda. It's my turn to thank you for um, that very rapid and rich overview of a very thick, heavy, and remarkably rich book, um, which has so much inside it, we won't even begin to skin the surface. Um, people listening might have noticed that um, Magda used, I think I lost count, but more than five times the word trail as she talked about her research and she was following the trail and her website is called the blood libel trail and i do want to share with everybody the fact that magda is really a remarkable historical detective and she did follow a trail of clues just as detectives do so this is a detective story um, a lot of these individual episodes have been known before although not all of them certainly not to everybody but it's magda who connected the dots and I want to um, talk to Magda about the dots a little bit later and the, or, or the connections. And the connections are these books that Magda talked about. But let me start by tying it to something that's a little more familiar to most people than early modern printing history. And that's the whole issue of social media and confirmation bias. So a thread that runs through Magda's story is how important it is to whether an accusation takes or does not take results in tragedy for Jews or not is what people already knew or thought they knew. And in order to maybe help Mag to tell that story, I thought we should go back to the very beginning and just tell people very briefly, Magda, if you can, the story of the first um, ritual murder libel, not yet a blood libel, and you can explain the difference between the two of them and maybe talk a little bit about how, because there was no confirmation bias yet to affirm, this was not yet for Jews a tragic story, though it is an ominous one. So do you want to tell everybody about William of Norwich? Okay, so the, yeah, Sarah is right. The, 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 the trail and the stories begin in, uh, the, in 12th century England, which for a while becomes this little hotbed of some of these stories until it, it moves uh, to the continent and, and then the continent becomes the, the, the more important uh, region. Um, but that story emerges as a, as a Christian story and it remains a story. Uh, no, uh, although there is a dead body of a, of a Christian boy, uh, no Jewish blood is shed, no Jews die. In fact, that story doesn't even become a story until m many, many years later. Uh, and, that's a, and that story is told more as a um, reenaction and uh, of taking William the boy whose body was found uh, as, a, as a sort of uh, figuration of, of Jesus. And the, and the story is told in a very familiar language, what becomes by now familiar language, um, but what scholars have shown to be a, a kind of mimicking of liturgical language of the passion, which is our week now, right? The passion of 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 Christ uh, during uh, during the um, the the Holy Week, um, and but that be remains a story, and that I call it in the book a broken memory trail because it it, it produces a shrine, it produces a cult, it produces a narrative, but that narrative and that cult is then forgotten. In, in Chronicles, it appears in, you know, predominantly in one line mentions, uh, but the narrative is lost uh, until much, much later. Um, if, if I could jump in, Magda, right here. Um, 
So because I work on the Middle Ages, this is the story of all the Magda stories that appears in her book, the one that I'm most familiar with. And two interesting points about this story. So William of Norwich was a 12-year-old apprentice whose body was found by a passerby in a woods outside of the city of Norwich in the east of England, where he lived. Uh, the body happened to be found on Good Friday. That turned out to be significant much later on. But as Magda was suggesting, the story for a long time was a big nothing. The boy was buried. Uh, a couple of people grieved, by and large. He seemed not to have been particularly missed. One of the most interesting things about the story is that nobody registered that the boy was missing. His body had clearly been lying there for at least a few days, maybe longer, and nobody had actually complained that he was missing. Only perhaps a decade plus after this boy died, a new monk arrived in town, uh, started working at the cathedral, started hearing the rumors about this boy, and seemed to sort of cook up a plot with the boy's uncle to blame the Jews and maybe get um, some profit from it, literal profit. They wanted to sell relics associated to the boy. They wanted to attract pilgrims to come to the story. So as Magda said, the interesting thing is that the story did not stick. Uh, a small local cult developed. It was not long lasting. It was mostly forgotten. And because I am so interested in the role that pictures, images, artwork, graffiti, play, in memory, it's worth noting that there was no iconography of the boy William of Norwich at all. Yeah. That is fairly significant to both prove and explain the lack of spread of this particular cult. And it, and it speaks to the point you raised, Sarah, that there's no yet confirmation bias because this is a right. new story. So the only reason why it has some resonance is because it resonates with the passion story because that's what the the liturgy is now going right it, the story emerges in the moment where there are significant changes in christian liturgy so it plays it it, it plays a role in that in that uh, in that transformation of the cultural christian culture moment but there is no yet this oh yeah a child is missing then therefore jews must have done it right this will become much later as these these stories become uh, become uh, more well known and disseminated, um, much much more much more late, yeah. So let's talk about then how or why or when this story, which was localized in England in its origin, made its way to the continent. Um, can you follow the trail for the listeners to the continent? Yes, yeah, so in the, uh, it, the, the this this well this particular William or Norwich story uh, enters as one liners uh, enters a continental uh, uh, monastic chronicles, uh, so it spreads. I uh, I believe through the same monastic circle, right? That the yeah. monk uh, Th Thomas of Monmouth was part of, right. uh, and enters that those uh, continental chronicle literally as a one line in Norwich. Uh, a, a boy was crucified by Jews or Jews crucified a boy named William and the wording might have changed. And it might be a, a not completely inappropriate analogy to um, think of these monastic circles as the medieval equivalent of chat boards or Reddit groups, how myths are born in small circles, tight knit circles. They're more likely to transfer stories one to another and they're maybe more likely to accept them and believe them because uh, the person purveying them is considered somehow or other vouched for or an insider. Right, and what they record is they record these unusual stories, right? So this was an unusual tale. So that enters those, uh, those chronicles, which is why later on, uh, any, any chronicle, any big uh, book that tells the story, the history of the world or the history of a king, really, re really uh, captures these unusual moments, right? They don't capture, just as our news media too, they don't, we don't read in newspapers about uh, daily life. We, we get news, we get different stories. We get stories that are thought may be important. We get stories that are weird. We, we get stories that are unusual. We get stories that, are, that and, and the similar kind of mechanism works for those, 
chronicles. They were recording the unusual. And later on, with the printing press, these monastic little notes end up being incorporated in the big world histories. Now we, we can, they can start beginning to tell not just a story of a monastery, not just a story of a town, but now a world history. And, and they become, with that, these stories and these notes become facts because these chronicles become these authoritative sources of knowledge of history. Uh, Magda, uh, I'm noticing someone asked in the chat, I don't see all of the chat, but someone asked for years. So if there are real history buffs out there who want okay. the years. Uh, William of Norwich died in 1144. The chronicle by the monk, Thomas of Monmouth, is how he's known. We know nothing else about him. Probably he started writing one version of notes. It's not a chronicle. It's just called the story of the passion the life and death and passion of William of Norwich. He probably started taking notes for it in the early 1150s. Uh, it, it probably wasn't finished in kind of published form. And there's, of course, there's no such thing as publishing in the Middle Ages, but there were authoritative handwritten versions circulated. That probably was not done until the 1160s. I tend to date it around the year 1170. Yeah. Um, and, and I do think that an important background to why Thomas of Monmouth shaped the story the way he did is this is the moment when medieval Christians are starting to focus their prayers and their imaginings and their devotions on the suffering, dying, and death of Jesus. Up until this point, it had been more typical to think of him as a triumphant savior king who conquered death rather than as a human being who suffered death. And so Thomas's description of the suffering of William of Norwich is very much drawing on contemporary and at that time quite new meditations on the suffering of Jesus. Yeah, and the other thing that is happening at that time is uh, the, the change in the process of who becomes a saint. Right. Right at that moment, you have debates and you need to justify why someone should be regarded as saint. And to me, when I was reading uh, Thomas's narrative, it sounded like a treatise justifying the establishment of the cult and, and, and justifying why this, this child should be, uh, should be worshipped. And, and precisely addressing the points that were coming out of the debates in Rome about authorization of cults. So it's a very much kind of apologetic treatise that speaks both to the uh, new devotion uh, to the suffering Christ and the justification of why some of these stories. And of course, once you have the devotion to the suffering Christ, um, as we even heard this morning in the news, uh, Jews become part of the narrative and part of the story. So here we have uh, how it emerges. Um, the, and then we have the shift, the, but the black, so that's the, I would call murder accusation. I actually uh, agree with my, my husband, Sean, who said we shouldn't be using the word ritual, this phrase ritual murder. And I, I, I think he's uh, absolutely right. This is a murder libel. If we have blood libel, mm -hmm. this is a murder libel. Um, uh, because Jews don't have rituals like that, right? Um, so uh, the, the, this is where the murder libel emerges, the story that Jews kill Christian children or Christians to reenact the passion of Christ, right, in the moment of this. And then when the, the, the story shifts to the continent, it also shifts a century later, also in a different devotional moment for Christianity, uh, and the blood motif is added. Now from uh, 1230s, as far as we can date, that's where the historical sources take us, from 1230s, now Jews are accused not just of killing Christian children or Christians, Christian children, Christians too, there, uh, there's a, an adult in, the story, in one of the stories too, Christians to reenact the, the passion of Christ, but now that they do it to obtain blood. Uh, and this is a key moment because that is uh, said to be obtaining blood for according to Jewish rituals, and that's when the authorities uh, 
actually intervene. And that's where uh, we begin to see, not directly, indirectly, Jews um, uh, clearly mobilizing to have authorities say, Jews don't do this thing, Jews do not believe in such things, Jews do not have practices, Jews in fact abhor blood and their law prohibits them from consumption any kind of blood. So that's where the arguments in defense of Jews become um, known and become pronounced in by Christian authorities, both by the emperor and the pope in 1247. Uh, so that's where we have that shift in. And as far as I know, uh, Sarah, and you might, might know better, but in England, the blood motif doesn't, the, 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 the other stories do not include the blood no, motif. No, that's right. It doesn't. That is do not. a continental story. That is a European continental story, the, the blood. And that's what, uh, what sticks. And it emerges in a moment, I said, particular to Christianity, because that's the century when the promotion of the doctrine of transubsti transubstantiation, that is the doctrine where during the mass, when the priest pronounces, this is my body, to the, wa the wafer turns into the body and blood of Christ. And that is the century where that doctrine is being actively promoted. Uh, and, and, and that's when the, the, the blood accusation comes into, into being. One of the innovations of the continent, again, uh, or no, actually, it's not an innovation of the continent. Is it first in England that um, Jews are killed because of the accusation? Where are... Well, again, it depends what we, we don't have, but, uh, but it's Blois. It's, That's it, right. Is where, where, at least this is a memory trail. We don't have court records. We don't have actual record. This is part of the, of the memory trail, but we do have mem the memory trail that is Jewish and Christian. So at some level, we can perhaps, uh, we can say that, Jew that Jews did die and the first Jews were killed uh, as part of those accusations on the continent. And then it returns back uh, to, to England in Lincoln. Um, Although we should note again that the accusation in Blois, that's for people who are listening, B-L-O-I-S, the French city of Blois, which did result in the execution of Jews who are charged with murder, that is quite an interesting, uh, tragic, interesting situation because in fact there was no dead body. That's right. Um, there was just a splash in the water. Somebody said, oh, it must be that Jews threw a dead body in the water. This seems to be a very cynical political accusation um, that was not any kind of full-fledged story narrative at all. So I don't know if that's an exception, um, a cynical... Right, and again, we don't know whether this was a political story, whether it actually was related or whether that 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 story now begins to stick and it's retrofitted later into that memory trail uh that's that's one of the one of the problems we have with and blue eye uh, was for those of you who are interested in date uh it's 1170 1180 again there are different um different dates different because there are not consistent sources about that um, so but the first dated um dated sources from Author, some legal authorities come from 12, uh, 35, 36, okay. and 1247, and then it returns to England for the first, uh, uh, for the trial uh, of Jews in 1255 in Lincoln. Right. right. So um, that's, that's right. Um, we can't talk about every individual no. blood libel accusation at all, but some people might be interested in the fact that this 1255 trial in which Jews were executed for the alleged murder of a little boy named Hugh um, made its way into Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, um, generally a much beloved collection. It's a somewhat problematic tale, but it is told by the prioress in the prioress's tale, the story of the alleged murder of little Hugh of Lincoln. And uh, I think that emphasizes the, the role of, of sort of pop popular literature and popular culture in disseminating the, some of these stories, that it's not necessarily always uh, disseminated through some authoritative works or legal sources, but often through, uh, through literature.
uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I think we need to jump ahead and um, maybe briefly tell the story of what you and Ronnie Poshaja has identified as, I mean, really kind of the pivotal moment in the um, ritual murder, murder libel, blood libel, is the story of Simon of Trent. If you want to quickly not just tell the story, but identify why did this become so central? So the, as I mentioned, this, the story is the kind of liminal story. So until then, these, these... And that the year is 1475. 1475, that's right, 1475. Uh, five. Um, until then, as we were discussing, these were dots on the map. These other stories were kind of dots on the map. And uh, this story, uh, a full narrative is, uh, emerges, uh, and the full narrative emerges before Jews are even tried. Um, uh, of Jews killing that boy named Simon in the northern, now northern Italian city of Trent in uh, Easter Passover season of 1475, in March 1475. And it is pivotal and it is important because of the iconography that I've shown in the, the, the slides that we've seen, the use of, of uh, the new media uh, in printing just is new, it's just two decades old. Uh, it's like the internet today, it's, it's, it's very new. Um, and it's, it's the first time when that new medium is used to disseminate it widely. It is also important because it becomes, it leads in the end, although it takes about a century, to this, the end of papal defenses of Jews. So the medieval period, if you want to uh, characterize it, is characterized by papal defenses of Jews. And after Simon of Trent, again, not right away, there are still a couple of uh, two more papal condemnations of anti-Jewish accusations, but because of what happens a century later after the Reformation and the recognition of this boy as a saint, the only one recognized at that point by, by the church, not a saint, I'm sorry, as a beatus, as a, as a venerated figure, he was actually never, uh, and emphatically the church authorities say he was never canonized, he never became a saint. Um, so this uh, calling him Saint Simon is, a, a an inaccurate statement and it was never accurate it was so one of the reasons i wanted to introduce this other than how important the story is as a medievalist um i and my co like so many of my colleagues we often find ourselves defensive when people assume that everything brutal everything irrational everything violent is medieval and so one of the interesting um aspects of the simon of trent story is that it is the first sort of modern blood libel in, in modern in that um, we know the names of all of the individual Jews in question. Um, modern trial standards were observed. We have the exact transcript of the trial records. We have the Inquisition. Quite. Not quite. Well, not quite <laughs> exact, but we have very detailed, if not exact, records of um, the torture of the Inquisition um, of the suspects. We know the names. Uh, we know the fates of the men, though not of the women involved. Um, and then again, it's the first time this is publicized, drawn up and pub publicized in print. And it was all supposed to be sort of very technical and up to date and above board. And yet it resulted um, not just in the brutal and obviously unjustified execution of a couple of dozen innocent human beings. Ending the, the life of the Jewish community in, in Trento. It ended an entire Jewish community, small, but up until that time, um, existent, extant Jewish community. And it gave rise to um, the modern phenomenon of the withdrawal of papal of defense of Jews. That's right. That's right. And it happened uh, it partly because these, the, the stories of Simon entered the Chronicles and, for, and they were repeated, re, uh, reiterated for a century that eventually, and the, partly because the Council of Trent, which was very important during the Reformation, Counter-Reformation, took place in Trent. That's why it's called Council of Trent. And many of the bishops saw and witnessed the, the relics 
of what I called a rogue cult because it was unrecognized by Rome. It was in fact the Pope in 1475, 1478 explicitly prohibited the veneration of Simon. But the local bishop kept it and kept it as a shrine and, you know, illegal rogue shrine, but nonetheless a shrine that existed. And then um, with the reform of the liturgical calendar, Simon is inserted uh, into a liturgical calendar, which gives it validity and it gives it more, gives the story more, um, even more dissemination than in the Chronicles, but certainly a huge validation because now it is uh, sanctioned by the church and eventually officially recognized as a valid cult, although again, not a saint. Um, let's, uh, I see we're, we're already running so short on time and we've only skimmed the surface of what we could talk about, but let's end our conversation part of this by moving um, somewhere quite personal to you and at this point to me, um, following the theme of kind of moder modernity doesn't end violence, brutality, and irrationality. Bring it all the way up to the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century, to Sandomierz, mm -hmm. which is a city in Poland that you have a personal connection to you and where you and I have both um, traveled and worked together. So do you want to talk about the Sandomierz episode? Yeah, I think it's a nice segue because the, the story after the a cult of Simon is recognized, the story uh, does spread and informs other trials and certainly validates other trials. And it is in fact used in court records uh, in the in Poland. Uh, and one of them is two, is a place of Sandomierz. Um, uh, where two notorious trials took place, one in 1698, although that one is less well known, than the other one in uh, 1710 that lasted three years and resulted in the deaths of, men, uh, of uh, many Jews who were accused um, in that town but also in iconography and it is no um the, 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 there's a very now infamous painting that is uh, actually paintings in that are extant in the town uh, in poland um and they were in fact informed by the cult of simon partly because or perhaps mostly because the priest who was a major factor and major instigator of the trials happened to travel and, and visited and spent time in Trent. And he brought pamphlets back, he brought ideas back, and, uh, and he left, in fact, a, a, a legacy, a material legacy of, uh, of this, uh, of the, the of both the trials in Sandomierz, but also legacy of Simon of Trent in, in Poland. And um, so the, the story lives on and uh, forces the local communities to, uh, to reckon with its own past, with a longer uh, sort of uh, past of the, of, the, of the church, although as even um, a few days ago, um, a major a uh, church figure in Italy has explicitly and probably issued one of the most explicit uh, statements since 1540 about uh, the, 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 how these accusations and particularly Simon of Trin was the original fake news and, uh, and a, 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 a false accusation and explicitly uh, shown to be false. Um, one that hadn't been really issued since 1540. Well, let's talk about um, what ties these two things together. Your research in Sandomierz and the recent statement issued by the Italian ecclesiastical figure were both to a large extent prompted by artworks, right? Um, sometimes people think artworks are just kind of incidental to the real stuff of history, but Magda and I both agree that sometimes artworks are the real stuff of history and they move history, and that is the case in both of these episodes, right? So can, can you talk about why you organized the seminar in Sandomierz? Um, I went to Poland for the first and only time because Magda brought me there to talk about these paintings in Sandomierz, and why did you feel that was so important? 
Well, uh, the, the, in Sandomir, the past and the present were entangled uh, very closely. And what I wanted, uh, the, the Bishop of Sandomir, and I think that speaks to both the statement that was recently issued in Italy and, uh, and in Sandomir to the leadership of the, uh, that how important these statements and 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 leaders are, um, and uh, so the the conference which uh, the bishop of Sandomir organized around that painting was meant to uh, provide a context and explain and uh, deal with that painful past and its material uh, remnants in in the in the city. So. Um, the uh the you know the dilemma is uh whether or not such remnants should uh remain or whether or uh, and therefore then the past the painful and horrible past forgotten or whether it would uh it should stay and be ex explicitly labeled and explained at what it meant in histo in the historical uh moment and um, that uh, that statement, in the in fact, uh, that was issued a few days ago um, a, by the president of the uh, bishops' council in Italy, uh, speaks exactly to that. That the 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 false myths produce reality, and uh, that is the suffering of an, uh, of the of the Jewish community in 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 in, in that, that case in Trent and also in in Saint -Omer. Although it is possible that the Italian bishops were concerned because there is a, an artwork. That's right, um, another artwork, right? So another uh, artwork, uh, a, a painting was just made and posted on Facebook by a professional painter and a painter with some talent who for reasons that I can't begin to guess about decided to make and publicize a painting of the alleged murder of Simon of Trent replicating all of the medieval, early, modern, anti-Semitic iconographical details that have been associated with that and other libels. Um, and this is, I believe, what prompted the bishops to feel the need to say yet again that the church does not endorse these accusations. Right, in fact, the, the statement was uh, the most explicit equating uh, uh, anti-Semitic acts and pre-production of such such art uh, almost to a heresy, which was quite uh, a, a, a astounding uh, statement. So, uh, what yeah, I found it, I think, but I do believe that it's the painting and the imagery that will probably be remembered, and not the words that were used. Nonetheless, the words and the public statements are key in. Um, inviting these kinds of um, uh, hateful, hateful statements. Well, let me uh, end um, this conversation on a rather dark topic by maybe offering people a note of hope because you do trace in your book um, ways that a myth can be killed as well as disseminated. Um, if it didn't disappear, at least in Italy, it stopped taking Jewish lives. And just briefly tell everybody how you explain the fact that after a while, accusations of Jewish murder ceased to be accepted. Yeah, they ceased to be accepted in uh, German lands, even though the really anti-Jewish um, uh, brutal iconography persisted and persisted through the period that trials did not happen uh, and in Italy um, and that is because there was a, a diversity of knowledge of sources of knowledge that is there were different views offered that people had access to different uh, different kinds of books and 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 information and that sort of di diverse diet of what you read uh, does dull the the edge of uh, that is the prejudice doesn't disappear, but it doesn't end in violence. Right. Um, so so the kind of the lessons your book really suggests and 
um, we're hoping that we're not going to see an outburst of ritual murder accusations or blood libel accusations, but we're living in a world when conspiracy theorism and bigotry seems to be growing rather than retreating. So the lessons of your book seem to be um, knowledge, 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 and different sources of knowledge and comparing sources of knowledge. You also talk in your book towards the end about the great importance of the rule of law and of a, a justice system that is committed That's right. to consistency, fairness, and evidence, um, which we hope we have in the United States, although I know some people start to worry that it's fraying around the edges. Um, and then finally, you suggest that it did make a difference. It's not a simple equation, but it does make a difference where there was knowledge of an interest in Jewish religion and ritual. It was harder to convince people to, that Jews did these things than where there was none. Is that correct? Or you think those are the lessons drawn? That, I think that that's exactly right. The rule of law, and that's why, you know, in the tribunals of Italy, Jews were not condemned. And that's why Jews trusted the courts. Um, and also uh, the, the different so sources of knowledge. Exactly. Knowledge didn't always seize prejudice but knowledge of the true aspects of Jewish rituals made it impossible to accuse Jews of these crimes. Even as one of the uh, Christian writers, Christian uh, who, who sought to, anti-Jewish really writers and who sought to convert Jews, he said that, you know, matzah is only made of flour and water. That's it, and it doesn't taste good. <laughs> you don't add anything, no salt, no, fat nothing and certainly not blood which was part of that uh, that story well i think he's wrong about one thing i think it tastes really good uh, yes but... <laughs> if, it's, if it's fresh it is but but for 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 this german german scholar uh he did not uh, he did not appreciate the taste of it but that knowledge certainly made that accusation uh Im implausible and ridiculous okay i think malgo is trying to catch our attention yes Yes, I emerged uh, out of the darkness um, because you, Sarah, you, 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 I understood that you were, you were ending the conversation. So I, I thought that this is a good time for the Q&A section. Um, I want to start with a question that I had, which is that I would like you to maybe talk a little bit more about the confirmation bias especially in the context of the most recent cases. So you mentioned uh, the Facebook group, you mentioned, of course, the shooter. Um, if you would like to br bring it all the way to the present uh, and tell us a little bit more about that and how, how it is even possible, especially in the light of what you have just, what you have just said. Well, uh, I think we tend to think about uh, that the Facebook groups and, and it's a new, f the Facebook groups, of course, is a new phenomenon and the um, information bubbles are a new phenomenon. They are only new insofar that they are, where they are being curated to us at some level by our algorithms. So maybe a little bit more, cho less choice than, than, than would have had in the past. But these um, group uh, bubbles and information bubbles existed in the past as well. And, and they existed, again, what you read, what sources of information you consider um, authoritative or rep reputable. And, uh, and so we see people only choosing the sources, the books that they want to read, that they believe uh, will uh, feed the information. I think what, what is interesting is what so sociologists uh, have shown is that when, you, when people have convictions, then when you show them that uh, convictions that are based on sources of knowledge they trust, that when you show them the arguments against their convictions, even though they might be factual, they are actually more entrenched in the beliefs uh, because, the, and, and they discount those other sources of knowledge. And one of the Polish writers um, put it wonderfully, who do, you, who, do, who do you trust, the church fathers or the rabbis, right? So, or the rabbis or the Jews and their defenders. So, so for, for him, this was almost impossible to imagine that a Pope would have defended Jews uh, because all these other sources of, of his knowledge were telling him otherwise that these stories were true. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Okay, so I will start reading the questions. Mm, question number one, why do you think that the blood libel aspect was added when the accusation migrated to the continent? Well, the, uh, and Sarah, you can also chime in because it deals mm -hmm. with Christian practices at the time, but in the 13th century, the, the, the idea that the wafer, the communion wafer transforms uh, into the actual body and blood of Christ, uh, and that after that transformation, if that, that wafer is harmed, the body and actually flows. Um, I mean, the blood is actually actually flows becomes a, an official doctrine. The beliefs had been there for many many centuries, but that becomes an official doctrine, and the church pushes for the um, for the um, a, a propagation of this doctrine. Yes, if I could, if I could, I mean, just in the middle of ages, Middle Ages did not uh, go to church every week. They went to church. At, at Easter, and they consumed the wafer at Easter, which often coincided with Passover, which uh, uh, during which Jews ma made their own cakes, mm -hmm. their own flat cakes. So there was this this uh, this uh, assumption of that uh, a conflation of that story. But Sarah, add on, chime in uh, as well. Yes, yes. No, I would just add to that that the the trend that i mentioned started in the middle of the 1100s um continued and deepened and expanded into the 1200s so in the 1100s people started focusing on the dead and dying jesus and on his suffering and so by the 1200s people had elaborately conjured up in their imaginations and in liturgy and in stories and in preaching and in song and in imagery more and more fantasies about where Jesus shed blood during his various tortures. They elaborated the tortures inflicted upon Jesus. And this devotional trend to feel compassion for the suffering of Jesus merged with the theological trend of insisting that the Eucharistic wafer and the Eucharistic wine turned into the body and blood of Jesus to just sort of heighten the drama around the entire mass ceremony and especially the Easter mass. And the, the name of my book is Dark Mirror for a couple of reasons, but the fundamental argument is that Christians imagined Jews as kind of negative reflections of themselves. And it was very, very difficult for Christians to think that something extraordinarily important to them, like the body and blood of Jesus, was not also important to Jews. They thought it was important for Jews to hate and hurt as opposed to love and cherish, but they just couldn't imagine that it wasn't important to Jews. And so it's the conflation of these devotional and theological and kind of psychological projection um, coming together to heighten the focus on blood. And, and, and then uh, certainly by the time it reaches Eastern Europe and in Poland, that theological motif almost entirely disappears. Uh, and th that's why we also have, uh, you know, girls who are victims. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, uh, men who are victims, it doesn't, uh, increasingly doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, the, the theological aspect only returns as this sort of historical supposed Jewish hatred of Christians that then is brought in as, as you see, and now they are doing it uh, to, to Christians uh, here and, and then. So, um, so that is the sort of the, the shift from medieval, really deeply steeped in theology and theological language and imagery, uh, stories and accusations shift to much more of a, of a focus on, on questions of cruel, cruelty uh, and, and hatred. Uh, and that is what then is transformed into the modern, uh, you know, anti-Semitism. It's not about, about, I mean, it, the Jesus, Jesus is still in the back of there, but, but the Nazis didn't care about Jesus. They cared about that other aspect of the story. But by the way, the Polish uh, stories are not in the Nazi list because they did not enter Western Chronicles and the Nazis only were using the Western Chronicles. So they only have a couple of examples and those examples come from the uh, Acta Sanctorum that 
the Lives of Saints that were published in Antwerp because a Polish priest sent the list uh, over to Antwerp and then it was included in, in one of the stories. So oh, nice of him. Um, you mentioned uh, Cardinal Gagnanelli uh, and his findings disproving the libel. Do you think the church could have done more to dispel myths? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so the the it's interesting. The the archival materials show really the dilemma. And my book, in fact, when I first uh, proposed the the book, it was supposed to be thinner, more sub circumscribed, uh, but more focus it was it was the, the working title was the pope's dilemma and it was about why the popes have suddenly uh stopped uh stopped defending jews and one of the things that has becomes clear is that the officials in rome do not believe in these uh in these accusations but their hands are tied because after 1580s Simon of Trent enters that liturgical calendar and is recognized. And they say, well, how can, can we defend them if the popes have already... Uh, so Ganganelli sort of dances around uh, Simon of Trent and one more, one, one more story, one more case that is recognized in 1755. Uh, and so there's a lot of behind the scenes acts, but not official statements, which is why I insist that official statements even if they are symbolic and even if they are not effective and we have to acknowledge that those official statements do not people don't suddenly stop hating people if somebody with authority tells them to stop hating people um this even if they are ineffective they put a a root mark uh, in the sort of history and that becomes very useful that becomes a sort of moral tool for those who want to act on it so even though there were there were huge efforts about defending jews uh, contacting people behind the scenes in the accusations in poland but they were resisting the public statements and yes if i could just jump in for a second um just to sort of reiterate what you said but maybe expand on it is um of course i mean anybody who studies jewish christian relations at any point wishes the church had done more i mean we would like to go back to the earliest christian writings and ask like saint paul like couldn't you phrase it a little differently please but um but there is the church is an institution it doesn't mean that it has control over all of the members not even all of the official ecclesiastical officials um so throughout the middle ages we'll see that the pope will try to formulate a policy and then it will be modified or totally ignored on the local level and one of the reasons i wanted magda to talk about the sandomir symposium that she organized around the paintings in the cathedral is because it really brought us face to face with the members of the diocese and um, we saw that there was still 300 plus years after the accusation, a range of reactions. The bishop was horrified by the existence of these paintings. He wasn't sure whether it would be better to get rid of them or to cover them up or to use them as teaching <laughs> tools. <laughs> right. Um, but he also, he, he organized this symposium wanting all of the people who lived in and worked in his diocese to learn more about it. And we found out that some people felt like even talking about this accusation was disrespectful to the memory of Brother Zhukovsky, who had been responsible for the death of the accused of Jews. And other people didn't even had never looked at the paintings, had never heard of the blood libel accusation, were confused about why it was even discussed, and then other people fell in between. So um, certainly leadership is extraordinarily important, setting the record, getting it down in writing, and entering it into the roles of law um, is extraordinarily important, but it's not going to solve everything. That's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you comment on blood libels outside medieval Europe, like Damascus in 1840 or New York in 1920s? Uh, what differences exist in societies where the yeah. church doesn't hold such outsized authority? Well, the, the Damascus effort also, uh, you know, uh, emerges in in the Christian context, and that is an, an importation from 
from Europe. Um, Sarah, I know you've been thinking about the New York case. Uh, so maybe you want to take that uh, that part of this. Uh, of I haven't been thinking about it enough to want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but I'll be it, writing about it soon. But it Stay persists, tuned. right? It persists. It 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 moves to um, to uh, Christian Orthodox contents and contexts in in Tsarist Russia. It moves to. Uh, it's used in then uh, uh, in post-war Poland as well, and and causes uh, pogroms uh, like the Kielce pogrom in in 1946 in Poland. Although I am now wondering how much that pogrom and that memory is revived by the Nazi propaganda, which of the uh, of the uh, blood libels or they would call it more murders, uh, ritual murders by Jews that is really ramped up during the, 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 the murder of Jew, the Jewish community in, in, in Europe to justify what na the Nazis were doing. So I think- Yeah, that, I'm, I think, you know, Magda made the important point when she discussed the Nazi imagery at the beginning, which is that although certainly um, Catholic Europe, medieval Catholic Europe is the context in which these ideas were born, um, just because the ideas look more or less the same does not mean that they require the same context. I mean, the Nazis represented a real secularization of the original accusation. And then some of the early modern accusations were morphed into more rational accusations. So that, yes, some, some alleged defenders of Jews against the accusation said things like, well, of course, we don't for a second believe that Jews use the blood to bake into their moxa. We believe they kill them out of hatred and a desire to revenge themselves on the Christians. I mean, is that better or is that worse? So, I mean, so, so these things overspill their original boundaries and church influence no longer becomes necessary. This is where confirmation bias plays such a strong role. I mean, for hundreds of years, people were told that Jews were murderers. And so after a while, it didn't really matter anymore. I mean, do we believe the, the original explanation for the murder was accurate? Do we have new explanations? The idea that Jews kill or hate Christians or hate Gentiles was so deeply ingrained, you don't need the theological devotional context anymore. Yeah, and, in, and I, I'll add just one, that when I was sitting and going through these hundreds of books that were published between the uh, you know, mid 15th century to 18th century, I said to myself, why wouldn't they believe it? That's all they read. That's all there is there, right? It was not, not why do they believe? Like, why would they, but that's all they could, they could read about in, in these books uh, that touch on these stories. So at some level, um, the, what we need to undo is we need to undo the whole sort of centuries of that dissemination of those stories as true stories. And, and show them why, how they were disseminated, why, why did they appear in these books uh, with such, uh, with such authority. And only then this can maybe gradually, gradually be, uh, be undermined. But, but really my, my shock was like, of course they would, that's all they could, they could read. That's what um, was available. I just noticed another question, if I may, Malgo, um, because this is very related to the current project I'm working on. The question is, do you see the rise of the Catholic lay orders, Dominicans, Franciscans, as affecting anti-Semitism and charges of the blood libel in Europe? Um, the answer is in a very complicated way, not in a straightforward way. So the Dominicans and the Franciscans usually called mendicant orders. We wouldn't necessarily call them lay orders because Dominicans tended to be um, ordained priests as well as preaching friars. What they had in common is they ministered to lay people in the cities and both orders, Franciscans and Dominicans, um, very much focused on preaching and on teaching every, everyday lay people and on translating their learned theology into kind of more folksy, comprehensible social terms. And in my work, I see that as an absolutely pivotal step towards turning theological arguments against Judaism into social prejudice against Jews. It wasn't always intentional. And there, there's a book um, 
by, by Professor Jeremy Cohn of Tel Aviv University, in which he argues that sort of a lot of the change in Jewish status was due to the preaching of Dominicans and Franciscans. Um, I don't think that, that most of the preachers in the orders set out in order to turn people against Jews, but every time they wanted to illustrate a, a, a concept of sin or virtue, they would encapsulate it in a folksy little story with a good guy and a bad guy, and not all the time, but frequently enough, the bad guy ends up being a Jew because it's just a shorthand, lazy way to have a bad guy. So that certainly contributed to people to people's rising belief that Jews tended to be at first mischievous and then resentful and then violent and then cruel. Yeah, and, and the Franciscans especially, they were especially interested in these. And we see in the uh, pre, uh, sort of uh, the weeks uh, coming up to the Trent trial in 1475, we have Franciscans preaching, a Franciscan, one particular Franciscan preaching, uh, and then that, that story is then so that he sort of had the premonition of the murder coming. And we also see in the same Franciscan circles, we see some of the popes that, who are taking the story seriously are in fact from the Franciscan order. But I would also add Jesuits. Uh, the Jesuits in the um, early modern period, Jesuit, the Jesuit order emerges in the 16th century, uh, but they become the, uh, the scholars of early modern Europe. They are the order that is committed to education, that is committed to uh, dissemination, serious research, archival research, but they are the ones who are contributing in fact to the rooting of the libels because they verify them in the archives. So they, uh, again, they are not modern scholars who are critically assessing the archival sources, what they are, whatever. They find them in the archives and therefore they say they are true. And then so they, a little, the lesson is a little learning can be a dangerous thing. Right, no, and I think that Jeremy Cohen's work also that knowledge and knowledge about Jews and their ritual doesn't always lead to lovey-dovey harmony. Not at all. Right. Not at all. But uh, but but there is uh, but but knowledge can be dangerous if again if it's not and as as they were they were they were um, you know using some of the perhaps you know modern uh, methods of research of going to the archives and looking at the original documents and not just repeating the stories from the chronicles and yet because they didn't have that critical um, methodology that we now have that they, they in fact contribute a huge uh, uh, amount of, uh, of you know, authority to, to, these, these, uh, to, to these stories. So I think it's also significant that the Franciscans were particularly devoted to the blood of Christ, yes. the suffering of Christ, uh, yes. because, yes. because St. Francis received the stigmata Absolutely. and this was such a big part of their devotional culture. That's right. That's right. So I think there is more research to be to be done on, Always. on the role, right, of these particular uh, orders in the the way they are uh, leveraging that knowledge and their their beliefs. Yeah, and I see that one of the con comments rightly points out that the accusation in New York in the, in the 1920s, and again, I will be reviewing a book about that coming up pretty soon. Um, was connected to the publishing of the Elders of Zion by Henry Ford. And I just thought I would throw in for listeners who are interested in the whole theme of anti-Jewish accusations, the blood libel certainly is the most graphic and sort of horrifying one, but it's, it's not the only one. It's not the most widespread. Um, until just this past year, there was an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in London about the myth of Jews and money. And the idea of kind of an international cabal of Jewish bankers um, and greedy Jews controlling international commerce, of course, has been, so it's just sort of roared back into life with the anti-globalization movement and with among anti-capitalists. And it's just as sort of unmoored from its origins as the blood libel was, so that, um, you know, if, if the, the, the kind of the image of the Jewish usurer can be traced back to medieval church attempts to end the lending of money at interests. 
it's lived well beyond anybody objected to the idea of making interest on their money. I mean, who doesn't these days? Everybody wants to find a bank account that pays a decent rate of interest. And yet it hasn't ended the excoriation of Jews for their alleged financial um, conniving in any way, shape or form. So that is kind of a much more widespread, if, if less graphically disturbing, myth that has long since outlived its original content. And like the blah blah, well, it's connected to theology. Right? It's connected to theology, but it doesn't have to be linked to theology anymore. And it's just as irrational. Um, Jews are accused simultaneously in, for example, Nazi literature of being communists and capitalists at the same time. Yeah. And of course, uh, uh, again, Jews were not the only money lenders, bankers in, in Europe. And that's precisely the point of your work, that the idea and association of user with Jews comes uh, at the time where exactly Christians were engaging in it. Right. And that myth emerges in that way. And it's so long lasting that someone is mentioning that it survives into Shakespeare's times when there are in fact no Jews in England. Uh, but that imagery continues. But the, the Shakespeare's Shylock is also interesting because mm. that play is not that popular. It only emerges as a, as a popular play in the 18th century when legal status of Jews is uh, actually um, discussed and debated in England. So, uh, so Shylock becomes Shylock in the 18th century. Until then, the story of Merchants of Venice is more like a comedy and, and romance thing than the Shylock figure. But the demonization of Jews becomes much more in the 18th century through the new performance of Shylock. Yeah, um, one of the kind of interesting unknown aspects of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, I mean, he probably wrote it because there had not been another popular play about a um, villainous Jew and he was sort of jump, jumping on the bandwagon. And I personally think it's just not that he was a philo-Semite or, or more tolerant than than his fellows, but he was just such a great artist that he couldn't create the two-dimensional character that the rival play had turned the Jew into. But what a lot of people don't know about The Merchant of Venice is like almost all of Shakespeare's plays, it was based on existing older material. In this case, there was a medieval story about a, um, a moneylender who demanded a pound of flesh from a debtor who couldn't pay back. But in the medieval story, the moneylender is Christian. Mm. Uh, I have one little question that um, I wonder if perhaps would be a good, uh, also a good sequel to the rule of law part. Um, someone asked, uh, are the samples of the of the paintings that we discuss, that you discussed before uh, and beyond, also the ones that you've shown in your presentations? Um, are they allowed on the internet and in your book? And when I asked about um, clarification, it was confirmed that it's it's really a question about the legal terms or like legal categories to to describe these uh, this iconography as a hate uh, iconography. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I'm not sure I understand, but the, I, there are. Um, images of some of the uh, early modern works in my book and there are also some um, of them in the website that is associated with the book uh, and they show these again regional trajectories and and the the, the trails of how iconography uh, iconography spread um, and i don't I don't know what the legal question here is related to iconography, um, but the early modern iconography is, you know, you can find it anywhere because these are not copyrighted <laughs> material. And I would add that there's, there's a website associated with my book that has something like 107 images of Jews, probably well over half of them distinctly anti-Jewish, although I do make the argument that all, not all Jewish iconography is anti-Jewish iconography. So there is no rule against having this stuff on the internet, but um, I was actually asked to consult with Google and Facebook to give them guidelines whereby they might conspicuously label works bigoted or intolerant. And that seems to be the approach 
that not all social media and internet platforms are trying to take, but that a lot of them are trying to take. Right, I, uh, and I think uh, I think uh, when you when you have uh, it's the use of those images, right. right? It's not their existence because we, you know, I teach a class on the history of anti-Semitism. I have to discuss the history of those images, right? Uh, so that students understand the 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 the, the depth and complexity of that. Um, so it's, it's, but then, um, just like my book, like, uh, the images that are out there can be used by people. And that is something that is not, I think we can't control right now. Um, and the only way to do it is to label such uses as for what they are, whether as anti-Semitic or as uh, false stories, libels, and so on and so forth so forth and making public statements about them but again in the way that um the, the one of the one of the uh, question is again it sort of goes back to the discussion we had earlier is if scholars do not address these images and do not actually uh you know show them in their own books and uh, in the in the context and explanation then what is going to happen is that only anti-semites are going to have a monopoly of those images and they are going to produce a a sort of a monopoly of a narrative of what these uh, what these images are and therefore we will not have that diversity of sources of knowledge and and uh and interpretations and explanations that are so necessary to dull these uh, these hateful ideas. Thank you very much. This thank was so much. Uh, this was a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you very much to the audience. We had 114 people uh, joining us. Uh, there is more to come. Please uh, make sure that you sign up on to our newsletter uh, at the Center for Jewish History so that you are up to date with all the programs. We have one more uh, Passover offering, which is a lecture of Jessica Cooperman uh, about interfaith uh, Haggadot and uh, interfaith American satyrs. So perhaps that's something that you might also find uh, interesting. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Magda. Thank you very much to uh, Sarah. And we hope that you're going to um, Join us next time for some uh, some more fascinating conversations. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Malco. I hope you will read both Sarah's book and, and my book, and we'll continue to have those conversations. Uh, yes. Please feel free to contact me. I am very Googleable, uh, and if you have any further questions. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, have a, a you know a healthy and peaceful uh, holiday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.